<laughs> Good morning, beautiful people. Um, back in the bathroom, in my little favourite place. This is where I feel safe. This is my therapy room. I have music as you can hear. Candles, plenty of bubbles. Relaxing. Um, my friend Heather noticed when she saw my other video that I've done in the bath. She says to me, I feel safe space. Isn't it? I'm like, yeah, yeah. It's, it's where I've done a lot of thinking and contemplating. Um, a lot of spiritual growth, a lot of mental growth, just in general. Um, I find it, it's good to relax and to chill out and just let your brain calm down. Um, so yeah, I've been wondering where to start with all this really. I, mean, I know I've done a few videos already, but um, just going backwards and forwards in my head, what to say, what, you know, what memories to bring up, um, what would help other people. Um, basically, I suppose <laughs> I best start off with memories. Um, now, apparently not everybody can remember way, way back to their early early days. Um, now I can't say how old I was in this memory. Um, I was very young, very very young. Um, I was still in nappies. Um, now there's a lot of sort of like blank area about my growing up. I've asked questions, obviously. Um, I get different stories from everybody. Some are twisted, some aren't. You know, it's. it's I don't know. <laughs> trying to work it all out over the years, you know, trying to put memories to certain things, it's been difficult. And when you're only getting sort of like a twisted lies, it, it's it's very difficult to work out your life. Um, but yeah, I've tried, I've tried. Um, and apparently, obviously I was born in 1974. Um, my mother, she uh, was 18 at the time. She just turned 18. If she was 18 in September, I was born in December. So, yeah. Um, my family said I wasn't with her for very long. Um, and to be honest, I only have two memories of her. Um, the first memory, I didn't even know it was her. Um, and even my therapist has said that it, it's very rare for somebody to be able to think back to such an early age. Um, now my first memory is of me. Um, I'm on two armchairs pushed together um, next to a fire. Now obviously I'm seeing it from my eyes so it's my memory. I, I look down, I see myself in a nappy, I see my legs, I see the chairs. I turn around, I see the front door because it's a bed sit. I look around a bit further, I see the little kitchenette. I keep looking around and I see um, a bed. And what I perceived for many years, I know it sounds strange, but um, a bed with a dome tent over the top of it. Now, yeah, very strange memory, but it gets, gets better. Um, I'm very distressed in this memory. Um, and then two people burst through the door. Um, they've both got long hair, but it's the 70s, so it could have been male or female, you don't know. Um, I don't know, I can remember sort of like khaki colour clothes. And one of them picks me up. And that's where the memory ends. Um, now, through whatever the family have said to me, um, I was passed over to them, to my grand and granddad. Um, I suppose, well, as far as I'm aware, with the family photos, I'm still in the pram. Um, very young uh, months, I suppose. I was sitting up, so I suppose six, seven months old, maybe up to a year, I don't know. Um, that's my first ever memory. And the therapist says it's very rare for anybody to be able to remember that far back. But I've, I've, I've actually, um, I spoke to my mum about this this memory, and she was like, "Yeah, yeah, yeah. You was on. You, I used to put you to bed on two 
chairs pushed together. Uh, we lived in a bed sit up in Queens. Is it Queens Park or something? Um, no, I can't remember. Um, it's not important anyway. It's in Blackburn. It's her, her bed sit. Um, yeah, and she she agreed to all this. Um, and it was only sort of like the last couple of years I actually it dawned on me what this dome tent was on the top of the bed it was actually the silhouette of my mum in bed um with the cover over her you know and she's a bit big lady or she was a big lady I don't know about now I've not seen her for so long I've not spoken to her for years um I don't really intend to really but um yeah so she never sort of like said anything about a tent. She 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 said about the bed and everything and how, how the flat was and and everything. Um and yeah that's where the memory ends. Now she's told me that she used to come and see me every weekend and all this and oh she loved me so much and all this and we used to go out and do stuff. Now I only have one other memory of her um, when I was growing up and I was only little again. I was still in Blackburn. Um and I must have been very, very little. I was about four. I suppose five. Um, around the same age as when your kids ask you, "Oh, can you count to a hundred? You know, and they're amazed because <laughs> I was actually walking down the road with my mum. I remember that I was allowed to get my hair wet in the rain because I was never allowed to have my hair wet at the time. My hood up if it's raining, you know, grand rules. So you know, I, I'm, I'm buzzing because I'm. Oh, I can get my hair wet. Nobody's going to tell me off because I got my hood down in the rain. And I'm asking who I thought at the time was my eldest sister, Heather, um, to count to a thousand. So, yeah, it's, it's around that age, four, five, maybe six, I don't know. I can't remember. Um, but I know we're walking down the road and we go into a pub. Um, and that's where the memory ends. Now, those are the only two memories that I've got of my mum. Um, even though she, she makes out that she, she, was, she loved me and everything like that and, and all sorts of things. Um, yeah, lost my train of thought now. <laughs> but uh, yeah, like I say, with the, the mental illness, it happens when I'm trying to remember stuff and shut down. So this is probably why with my videos it's going to be certain bits of certain parts of my life because there are times where I can't talk about things because my brain won't let me, so I'll have to talk about something else instead. Um, there will be people that do, who relate to this when they get stressed or you know they, they have to talk about, especially through therapy, and when you've got to talk about memories and things like that. Um, your brain does shut down. Um, it protects itself. It's, it says, no, I'm not going to let you relive that memory because you're just not ready for it yet. I'm not ready to cope with that. So it will shut down and you can't think of anything around that, even the subject, to bring that memory back. It's just all gone. You've got to <laughs> completely go on to something else. So I am sorry if, if I chop and change with certain things or my stories go off into certain areas, you know, it, it's just it's just how my brain works, unfortunately. Well, I won't say unfortunately. I like the way my brain works now. I understand it, so I've accepted it. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a strange thing. Um, little is known about the brain. They're only really just starting to realise that it's, it's the main computer and, you know, it, it does amazing things. Uh, you know, it can stop somebody from doing, talking straight away. Like, you know, it can do all sorts of amazing things, but it can also have a lot of damage through abuse, um, mental, physical. Um, yeah, it's... It's hard to understand when you don't know what, you, what you're going through. Um, and having to piece all these memories back. Um, a lot of them I used to think was just dreams, you know. Um, you might even go through that where, you know, you have this memory that's it's there. But you don't know if it was a dream or not. Um, when you get people that actually turn around and say, oh yeah, that's, that's, that's how things were and that's what happened, you know. It's, it's, it's a relief because you don't think you're going crazy when you've been told lies about things as well. It's trying to weed out the truth from the lies. And lots of memories that I have, I've had to place together um, to work out the story. Um, 
and it's only only since oh, since I lost my tattoo shop when my back went um, and my mental health really declined um, when I sought help when I actually decided to look into my own mental illnesses um, what caused them it's only then that you start to realise that these memories they are memories, they weren't dreams these, these events actually happened to play, play bleh, 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 can't speak, and to put them all together into this big, you know, ah, this big puzzle into one picture. <laughs> it's, it's quite a relief, really, because you know that you're not going mad. Um, even though people are telling that you that you are, that you're a liar, um, that you've made things up, you know, you, you're just trying to destroy people's lives because of these things that you're saying about them. No, um, I'm not a liar. Um, yeah, I was when I was a kid. I had to be. It was survival. Um, but some members of my family don't actually get that. Um, so I should explain that now. Um, I was being abused by... Uh, oh, I thought at the time it was my brother, but it turned out to be my uncle. Now, I'm going to mention his name because it'd be easier. Stephen. He's called Stephen. Now, um, there's things I remember about him. And they're not very nice, not at all. Um, I can understand there's like sibling rivalry and things like that, but then there's just plain, plain meanness. Um, whether he knew that I wasn't his sister or not, I don't know. Um, I'd like to think that he did know, and that was the reason why he did stuff to me, you know? But looking back on things, I can see dysfunction in the family, especially where my grandma was concerned, narcissist. Um, she played on sibling rivalry and things like that, you know? Um, you can look at all the terms, flying monkeys and things like that. And as I've got older and I've realised, looking into the psychology of things, how, how things played out, and just the role that everybody had in the family, now, because I was being abused by my uncle, uh, my uncle Stephen, um, he used to punish me if I cried out for help. Um, I remember crying for some reason, uh, whether he'd hurt me, possibly. Um, trying to cry out, ah! He'd cry louder than me. He'd go, la 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 la, drown out my voice. Um, he'd shove his horrible sweaty socks in my mouth shut me up, he'd sit on me, he'd do all sorts, he'd punch up. So hard, so hard. Dead leg, dead leg, dead arm, dead arm. You know, you should try to fight, try to fight back. But he was 10 years older than me. Um, so yeah, it was very difficult to fight back. If I went to run, run for help, he'd stop me. Um, yeah. So he'd punch me more, um, hurt me more, for so trying to go and get help. So with that, you know, if I ever did go for help, um, I'd be telling my gran what happened. Um, he'd come and say it was a lie, the reason that he'd hit me or was stopping me from crying was, or why I was crying is because I'd done something wrong. So i get punished by her, even though I'd done nothing wrong. Um, and then i get punished by him for telling the truth. So, yeah, growing up, it was very confusing. Um, you try and tell the truth, you get punished. You tell lies, you get punished. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's, it's very difficult for a little child to understand that, you know? So I learned to read people very, very quickly. Um, part of being an empath. Um, you need to know your enemy. Um, you need to work out people quickly and you need to work out um, if they're angry, sad, happy, you know, and try and make the situation better, you know, try and calm the situation down so you don't get hurt. Um, which more often than not, I got hurt, you know, so. <laughs> but you can't hide when you're that age, you know, you've been told you've done wrong, even though you've been doing right, you know, you've been trying to tell the truth. You'd be calling out for help, and nobody's giving you that help, and you get battered and abused.
for actually speaking up for yourself. So yeah, my voice was stifled at a very early age um, due to just those two people. Um, yeah, it's, it, was, it was very difficult. Um, but now I know that my voice was stifled. I know the reasons why. Um, I can understand that the situation um, on the narcissistic side of things. I don't know about my uncle Stephen. I don't know what mental health issues he's got. Obviously, he's got some. Um, but I've not been around him for many, many years. So when I've gone through this stage of learning about other members of the family, I've still had a little bit of contact with them. So I've actually been able to recognise the patterns of um, their own mental illnesses, even though they say they haven't gotten one. But, you know, <laughs> do the work, you'll find out that you have. Um, so, yeah, it, my train of thought again. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, no, it's gone. It's gone. So with that, I think I should get on with my path. <laughs> and um, yes, uh, I'll think of something else to say. Um, like I say, I don't know where I'm going to be going with these videos. Um, I'd like to about my experiences um, and the mental illnesses that it caused um, and a lot of other things my healing process um, especially sort of like talking about the different types of mental abuse um, because that gets hidden away and nobody sees that behind closed doors, but nobody sees that on the outside either. Because there's certain ways and certain as aspects of a narcissist that can even when you're out in public, you know, they'll be the most charming, loving person ever. But they'll still have little looks that they give you and little words that they'll say that you know that you're in trouble. You know you've said the wrong thing, you've exposed them or you've not played the part that they want you to play. You know, you do get to recognise all these things. Um, and especially in a family unit, um, you get a re to recognise what part you play. Um, basically, I was a scapegoat. Um, yeah, I was blamed for everything, <laughs> whether I'd done it or not. You know, and I got punished for it. Um, very harshly, very harshly. Um, but yeah, it, it's once you find out who people are and how the brain works you can start to, to not feel guilty for their actions if you know what I mean um, I always thought I'd done something wrong you know even when I hadn't so that's guilt um, it comes from being in abusive relationships whether it's a partner whether it's a friend whether it's a family you know they make you feel guilty guilt trips for doing this for doing that even if you haven't done it, you know, it's it's a hard thing to shake as you get older. But um, once I realised the mind games, um, the patterns of things that they do to keep control over a situation and over you, um, it's, it's very easy to recognise, you can predict it. Um, yeah, <laughs> it's quite funny to watch really. Um, <laughs> You see the pattern of things going on. You say something, and they do something. And you think, right, okay, that's going to come next, and it does. And you just sit there and you grin to yourself, and you think, <laughs> what a knob. <laughs> Sorry, that's my way of thinking. I do. Um, yeah, I've I've, I've noticed um, the way narcissistic people play the games, um, especially over the last three years. It's been funny, um, and it. it to me, it's easy to forgive because whether they know that they're doing it or not, it's part of who they are. I don't take it personally. I don't take it personally at all because it's not just me that they like it with. They like it with everybody. Um, it's just how their brain works. Um, and until they understand this, until they recognise it, and until they do the work to change it, they'll, they'll never change. First of all, they've got to really recognise that they're the problem. 
and they always have been the problem. Um, but some people just cannot see that. They haven't got a part of the brain that will let them recognise that. Because um, when your brain develops, it can go two ways. You can go to the empathetic side of things and be highly sensitive to everything around you. Um, be a highly caring, loving person. Um, or you can go the opposite way and be <laughs> a complete shit. And the most evilest, nasty person ever, you know? Capable of murder, you know? Causing harm and you love it, you know? That, that's... It can go either way. If that connection is not made in the brain at an early age, it's difficult to develop. And without the proper help, I don't know if it ever will develop. Um, I've not really gone into that much of the science behind um, that sort of thing. Um, I know y- your brain's capable of making new connections, growing new neurons. Um, so it, it could very well be possible. Um, they call it, call it neuroplasticity. Your brain's like plasticine, really. So, I mean, for many years, people have thought, oh, no, we brain can't change once it's that it's that but no it, it can change um <laughs> I'm, I'm proof to that thing you know to that um, I never thought my brain would change at all but once I understood how it worked and the psychology it did start to change um this music in the background um this was called the butterfly effect um it's um sound frequency um 432 hertz uh, it stimulates parts of the brain that doesn't normally get stimulated so with that along with therapies and understanding certain things about psychology and brain chemistries and things like that you start to understand how everything works um on the lower vibrations, you know, on, on the negative side of things, and then on the higher vibrations as well, the positive side of things. Um, it's, it's how I've gained control of my life again, how I've gained, gained control of oh, anxiety and panic attacks. Um, it, it's, it's like, since around Christmas time, I suppose, or just after Christmas. Um, normally my daily routine, if I was going out anywhere, I'd be panicking like mad. Um, especially if I was going to stay in somebody's house, I, uh, <laughs> I'd repack my bag four or five times, checking that I've got everything sorted, that I've packed everything, and still going in and out of the rooms, checking everywhere that I've got everything, counting my money over and over again before I get out the door, make sure I've got enough of my bus fare, make sure the times are right, checking the time schedules for the buses before, well, it would have been the night before, on the day, while I'm at the bus stop while I'm on the bus, you know, over and over again, the same things, you know, it's obsessive, compulsive, anxiety, panic attack. And it, <laughs> I've been noticing, um, <laughs> I don't do that anymore. Um, it's quite mad, it, it really is quite mad. Um, now, this is quite personal to me, um, this that I'm gonna share with you now. Um, a part of my OCD, used to be a part of my OCD. Uh, people who know me will, will know, or people I've talked to really deep about this will know that um, I used to, well I say used to, but yes, it's good that I can say used to, I used to do it all the time. Um, I used to pick my skin, um, not just little, head to toe pick. Uh, I spent hours and hours and hours just zoning out, picking spots. Um, to the point where I'd pick holes, big holes, not little ones, um, stuff you can't hide, you know, all over your face, all over my arms, or everywhere, everywhere you, I could reach to get a spot, I'd pick, if I couldn't reach it, I'd get something where I'd stab into it to pull it out, you know, and that's how obs- obsessive I was, now, <laughs> I've not done that for months and months and months, and it used to be a day in anything, um, especially before I had to go out anywhere. Um, if I was stressed out, um, it would be my go-to. Um, I'd have to cover the mirrors in my place. 
I'd have to wear long clothes, you know, so I wouldn't just have exposed skin to sit there thinking, picking. Um, uh, it was horrible, it was terrible. And I started this when I was about teenage, 13, 14. Now, when my grand saw this, <laughs> oh, because firstly, I never had nails, so I used to use my teeth to just bite my skin, popping out these little spots, even imaginary ones, like, you know? And my grand used to call me a junkie, or say that I looked like a junkie. I never knew what a junkie was. <laughs> I had no idea at all, but I knew it wasn't good. Um, yeah. Um, now, she took me to the doctors about it. Now, it wasn't a psychological doctor, it was just a local GP. And the only thing that, that happened with that was he didn't see the psychological things, the side, psychological side of things, because I was going through so much at the time. Um, he just saw that, oh, my skin spotty. You used to get what he called milk spots. Um, and I had to cut down on the amount of milk that I was drinking or water it down. You know, I didn't drink much milk as it was. We only got a few pints a day and, you know, I wasn't allowed to drink shitloads of milk, even though I'm a very big drink, uh, milk drinker. <laughs> I love my milk. Um, yeah, so even back then I couldn't understand why and I knew it was a bit more than that. Um, but no, nothing got investigated or anything like that. I'm just wondering actually if it was just after I got told who uh, everybody was. Because it was around 13 uh, that I was told about um, my older sister being my mum and my mum and dad being my grandparents. Blah, blah, blah. Um, so yeah, it, it could have been something to do with that. Um, I was getting bullied at school and things like that as well, so it was all that on top of it and getting bullied at home and everything's in. Um, yeah, so that become an obsession. Um, I've stopped that now, completely. Um, I mean, I might pick the odd spot now again if there's a big one that I do. But, you know, not, I'm not stood in the mirror for hours and hours and hours on end just picking up my skin. And it's... it's <laughs> It is brilliant. I used to be so embarrassed going outside. Um, you know, even in the summer with my friends at school, you know, they're all going swimming baths and there's me, or you can even see, and there's me, even me swimming costume on a t shirt over the top because I've got these fucking big red blotches all over me, and scabs all over my arms and everywhere, like, you know. And as I got older, it got worse and worse. Um, yeah, I would pick holes, big holes. I mean, it was. I remember having one here, and it was literally that big, massive red hole in my face. Um, but I spent hours and hours just picking and going over thoughts, old arguments, old scenarios, old situations, old <sighs> everything and anything just going through my head. I couldn't calm my head down. Um, and this therapy room helps. <laughs> but once I started understanding what was going on and coming to terms with everything and eventually letting things go and, and learning to love myself and see myself worth all this stopped all the anxiety all the panic all the OCD it's it's very strange but I, I love it I absolutely love it um, I wouldn't change it for the world yeah, so, yeah, I know I've walked on a bit more, so I'll leave you with that thought. Um, I shall go and finish off my bath and my favourite session. I'm deciding to do my hair again, I'm going to be purple and pink again. It's all dying out and going sort of like, a very like blue and pinky and green and all sorts. I like it though, I do like the bright colours. So, have a nice day everyone, bye bye.